Well, hey, let me pray for us and then uh, we'll rock and roll. Father, uh, thank you so much for the day. Thank you for life. Thank you for this rain. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, just crossing our paths through the connection and bond that we have in our relationship with you. Thank you for uh, the collective hearts of ministers who are here, who are the places that you have placed them to serve. Uh, God, I just pray that they are encouraged, that their cup is full, uh, that they are inspired, that they are more in love with you, uh, that God, that they can be even more in love with your people. And so, Lord, bless this time. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, a little bit about myself. Uh, Chance Franks, I grew up uh, in a big city of Lockhart, Texas, right outside of uh, Austin, San Marcos area. Uh, I claim the fame with the barbecue capital of Texas. We got a uh, Got great barbecue. I thought all barbecue was the same until I went off to college and started trying other barbecue. Then I realized all barbecue is not the same. Uh, so God's spirit definitely resides there uh, in Lockhart. But grew up there, grew up a preacher kid, so I was definitely the, the <laughs> prodigal son, uh, preacher kid, where you you know, grew up around the world, grew up in the house, grew up and dad modeled that. Uh, but I was that preacher kid that's like, ah, I'm good, you know, in church all the time. Dad would pretty much practice his sermons with me and my friends where we'll be hanging out playing the Nintendo and uh, he would come in and, and give us his his preview uh, for for Sunday. Uh, but the good part of aspect of that is, is that uh, he taught me a whole lot of Bible scripture that even I wasn't walking with Christ was still uh, stored in my heart. Uh, and a lot of the, the old King James. And so when I try to memorize a verse or I hear a verse uh, outside the King James, my brain is at war with each other uh, because the D's and dials and all that is not is not in there. But I uh, left there, graduated, went to college at Midwest State University in Wichita Falls, uh, played. Hey, in this year, there's a, there's another college conference that's going on here in Fort Worth. Uh, is I met a young lady that serves on campus there at Midwest, and she, she's there now, so that's pretty cool. Um, so went to, went there to play football at Midwest State University. Uh, when I got to college, pretty much said, "Hey, I've I've had enough of this church life. I'm pretty much, you know, I'm good. I've had enough church to sustain me, and I'm good." So lived out the typical college life, you know partying, chasing girls, uh, identity and, you know, my sports and football and, and did that for, you know, four years, graduated with the graduate school. When I was in graduate school, um, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. Um, you know, was, you know, football wasn't there no more, but I wanted to coach college football and tried to get a GA coaching job at different universities. Couldn't make that happen. Uh, so I started throwing parties. Uh, so I was doing these promotional parties while we rent out a club, get a DJ. And in Wichita Falls, there's a big military base and everybody on that base is from the East Coast. And so coming from New Hampshire, Boston, Maryland, to Wichita Falls, Texas is a culture shock. I mean, you go from Timberlands to cowboy boots. I mean, totally culture shock. And so what I would do is rent out this club and play East Coast theme type music. And so it was a big hit. I was making a whole lot of money in college, making a whole lot more money than I'm making right now. And a lot of my identity was tied up in that. I mean, I, I did, y'all remember this. I know you remember this, the MTV Pimp My Ride. Uh, I had a Toyota Corolla, just totally freaked that bad boy out. Brand new paint job, Lexani rims on there, Kenwood speakers, uh, leather seats. Uh, had a little light on the side that when I would take a right or left turn, it would flash, uh, you know, nice. So it, the car was legit. It, it was cool. Um, but man, was living that life, um, a lot of money. And man, just God just began to just allow a series of events to wreck my life. Went through uh, a relationship breakup um, that, you know, I guess broke my heart technically at that particular time. Um, just things with, you know, trying to run this club just was falling through the cracks. And but my foundation in Christ, it was always there. Like I can I knew, you know, driving home from the club, Lord, let me get home safely tonight. You know, God, let me get let me let me knew I wasn't living right. And so. Uh, this pretty little young lady invited me to church one day, and I thought she was cute. And I said, all right, man, I'll go. And as I got to hanging out with that college group, it was a group of young adults who were serious about their faith. And I think that's what I needed, uh, a group of young adults who were serious about their walk with Christ. And so I left everything, gave my life to the Lord in 98, uh, left the party and left the money, and everybody thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy, uh, but I just started, you know, started walking with Jesus. And I mean, it was, it was hard, I mean, because I lost a lot of friends. I at that particular time, didn't know how to separate the old lifestyle with the new lifestyle. And so I just totally left my lifestyle. And, and, and in some aspects, if I could change that season, I would. I would have been more 
gracious to continue those relationships and not just sever. It was, it was, it was hard. It was, it was hard. And graduated from Midwestern, um, master's degree, still felt God wanted me to coach. And so opportunity for it came open for me to uh, coach there at Midwestern. So I got opportunity to be uh, the running back coach there for a year with a guy named Bill Maskell, who is still the head football coach there to this day. So he's been there 20 something years and coached running backs for the year, had a great year, great group of guys. But at the end of the year, just felt like God was calling me to ministry. Didn't have a clue what that was going to look like. Didn't know what that was going to look like. So I moved to Dallas. I was a youth pastor for a while and I was working at Target. Um, and I hate Target to this day. I was the clothing line director. Uh, and man, you want to talk about leaving college with master's degree and yes, and being at Target and with the red and khaki and, and, you know, putting hangers and clothes and all that kind of good stuff. And I was at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship where my wife and I, uh, that lady who invited me to church, she also moved to Dallas to go to medical school at UT South, Southwestern here, here in Dallas. And we were at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. And we were both in, in a season, I think, of just lostness because she took a year off, a gap year before she went to medical school, just trying to figure out if she wanted to be a doctor and all that kind of good stuff. And, man, our young adults past at the time was preaching about Moses, and he was talking about Moses being, you know, the 40 years in the wilderness and the 40 years of service. And I just remember going up to him and saying, hey, bro, look, I just heard you talking about Moses in the wilderness. Like, I just feel like God has just left me out there. Like, I'm in the wilderness right now. Like, I don't know where I'm at, feel lost, all that. He took me on his arms for the next three years, uh, discipled me, under, also under the teaching of Tony Evans, and just really had a big impact on my life. So wife and I get married, that girl who invited me to church, uh, we've been married 18 years now. But during that period as well, too, uh, I was still praying about being around coaches and athletes and got a call from my pastor one day and said, hey, I'm going to the Fellowship Christian Athletes office. Do you want to go? And I didn't know much about FCA. I wasn't involved with FCA in college or high school. So I didn't know anything about it. And I was just like, ah, all right, I'll go. So I went hanging out. And as I got to meeting those guys and talking to those guys, I realized like, oh, like they, they work with coaches and athletes. They minister to coaches and athletes and, you know, shared, you know, my desire to do that. So they invited me back and, uh, and come speak at a local couple huddles and speak and stuff like that. Cause y'all know how campus ministers and FCA is. We'll, we'll, we'll volunteer you quickly and just kept hanging out with those guys who eventually they offered me a job. And so, uh, been with FCA for 18 years now. Uh, my first, uh, five years I was, at SMU and also working with local high schools and junior highs on the Dallas side. Um, in 2010, uh, opportunity came open. TCU has never had a full-time designated staff person uh, to that did FCA ministry. And so they were, they were developing a life and character coach. And so there were some doors that were closing at SMU in, on my particular role. The head coach, the coach that I was working with at first, Phil Bennett, uh, he got fired, and then June Jones came in for Hawaii. Worked with June for a year. And the second year, June brought his pastor in to be the chaplain. So in some ways, I got, like, demoted, fired. You know what I mean? And I was, like, devastated. But God really used that year uh, to show me that ministry is not about me. You know, it was really to say, it really taught me that year to say, hey, hold your hands open. And if you hold your hands open, I will move around closed doors and open doors and bless you in ways that you couldn't imagine. And so... They go through that season. They make it to a bowl game. And that was significant because SMU hadn't been to a bowl game in years since the death penalty. And so we had, you know, had got close the year before. And and I was watching their bowl game. Here I was in Dallas and they in Hawaii. And I'm just mad. I'm just like, I should be there. Like, I should be right there on the sideline with these dudes. And just righteous anger and just upset seeing the coach pass their own, you know, on the sideline and all those kind of things. And I just feel like God told me right before halftime, you're done. Your time at SMU is done. And I just had a level of, of peace uh, and a level of, I feel like God just allowed me to release the pain or the pain of re reject in what I was feeling that moment. And so told my wife, that was December of 09. It was Christmas Eve, December 09. Uh, a couple months later, I was in Kansas City at, at an FCA convention and met a guy named Donnie Snyder. He said, hey, I heard about the stuff that you were doing at SMU. We're getting ready to start this position at TCU. Would you be interested in the interview for him? I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. So we started going through the interviewing process, came down to me and a guy who played football at TCU, very well connected here in the Fort Worth area. And I remember telling Donnie, like, you need to hire that guy. And he looked back and the guy said, no, y'all need to hire Chauncey. I'm not the guy. And so... 2010, came over to TCU, 
2000, January 1st, 2011. So we go through the, t- the 2010 football season. That was historical football season. That was the year TCU went to the Rose Bowl. We went 13-0. and So in that one year, we won more games in the five years I was at SMU. So almost a year to date when God told me, uh, 09, 2009, December 25th, January the 1st, 2011. So we go through that year, but it was January the 1st, 2011. I'm in Pasadena, California, uh, in the granddaddy of all, the Rose Bowl, uh, with my wife and my son uh, coming out the tunnel uh, with TCU's football team. And just remembering back to that moment, sitting in Dallas, and God just said, you're done. And But God was preparing my heart for where he's had me at these last 13 years. And so <clears throat> in the last 13 years, been here at TCU, uh, serving as a life and character coach. Um, we have a great staff. We have a team of four uh, that serve on that campus. We have... Uh, Coleman Maxwell from La Mesa, Texas. Uh, we have Mitchell Travers from the Houston area. Uh, played baseball at TCU, was discipled through the ministry of FCA, and recently brought him back, brought him on staff um, last October. Then we have Carrie Casey. Uh, she is from Franklin, Texas, and she was on staff at Sam Houston State, and we recruited her away. And uh, God has blessed the ministry. We have seen some just Phenomenal favor from the top to the bottom, from administration to the athletic director. Um, FCA is woven into the athletic department. Uh, we are in a lot of ways considered faculty. Uh, during the football season, Cole and I, we travel with the team. Uh, our national championship run, you know, we're there. My family is there. My kids are there. They got a chance to experience it all. And so it's been, it's been great. And so what I just want to encourage you guys with, and then just today, just, you know, Q&A, you know, just to fire away as it relates to, I'm sticking in the lane of, I wasn't sure if this was for like high school or junior high or collegiate. They just said reaching athletes. So I wasn't sure which one, uh, but I, high school, okay, we're going to focus on, cause I think there are two different, two different lanes. I think the collegiate one is probably more of a mystery uh, than the high school, junior high one. But I think we're going to just focus on the collegiate one. Man, you know, one of the things that I love about um, man, an athlete and just, you know, as we look through the scriptures, we see that how the scriptures gleam and look at the life of an athlete. It looks at the attributes of an athlete. I mean, we're all familiar with 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. It says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one received the prize? Run in such a way that you may get the prize. Everyone who competes in a game goes into strict training. They do it who they do it to compete in games. Uh, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that I may have, uh, that I, after I preach to others, myself will not be disqualified. I love 2 Timothy uh, 2, 5 says similar. If anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victorious crown unless he competes according to the rules. And then 1 John 5, 4 says, this is a victory that has, that has overcome the world, our faith. And so we see out through scriptures that the word looks at the life and makes the parallel of our Christian faith in the life of the of an athlete, because we know the sacrifice, the dedication, the heart, mind, and soul. Uh, we know that how sports can have us in the greatest of joys at one moment and has us the lows of the lows. I mean, our emotion, our time, our energy goes into watching athletes compete. And we know, especially in the world of college sports, that college athletes in our society, and I would probably argue that college football is probably one of the biggest influencers uh, in our society, in our nation. Um, I mean, I know y'all are probably know, and y'all probably watched that game when we played against uh, Georgia, and Georgia baptized us uh, in the name of Jesus. But if you were to tell me, I probably wouldn't, couldn't name maybe one or two high schools in your particular area. But we are, we are, we know the Texas Longhorns. We know the Michigan Wolverines. We know the Ohio States of the, of the world because sports are a big part of our society. College sports, college football is a billion dollar industry. I mean, you have college coaches that are making $5 million, $10 million a year. And you look at this, I'm like, it's just a ball. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, 
they get paid very well for this game. And if, you know what, if we stop playing football tomorrow, life would keep going on. But we put a very high value into the world of sport. We all know f crazy fans. We've seen video of fans in, in, the, uh, in the stands fighting. And we see, we've seen house divided of a, of a, a Texas A&M or a Texas Longhorn individuals. Like sports are a tremendous part of our society. But behind those brands and behind those images are young men and women who make up those teams. And our role as ministers is how do we capture the heart of these individuals? And that's what I want to do today. And so one of the things I think that is important for us to understand is that, the, and especially from the lens of a church connecting to the heart of a college athlete, what are some of the things that I think is important is that to understand that these are unique individuals, and especially if you are and pretty much I would say any level, and especially at the higher levels, that there is a demand on their time and schedule that leaves them very little margin to do anything else. And so it would be easier to be a college student and work a full-time, 40-hour-a-week job than it is to be a college student and a college athlete. Their time is from the minute they wake up to the minute they go to bed, it is a long day schedule. For example, our guys, our guys probably wake up somewhere around five o'clock uh, because they have to be at the facilities at six o'clock. And so that is giving them enough time to get to the facilities, giving them enough time to get in their car, get enough time to get dressed in their athletic gear. Six o'clock, they're sitting up in a room. They are they're watching whatever they need to, to watch film, going to a meeting. By from that probably go from about six to about 7.30. 7.30, they probably grab a quick sack, snack. Eight o'clock, they're on the football field. Eight o'clock, they're going to go from somewhere between eight to ten, and probably about ten thirty. After ten thirty, they're going to shower, and then after they shower, they're going to go to a mandatory lunch. They got to eat lunch, so they got they go go and they're going to eat. After that, probably around twelve to one, they're going to get ready to start going to class. Probably for the next several hours, they have they have class. They get out of class, and then they have study hall, and then they get out of study hall. They got to figure out, you know, they might have a, a window of, of time to have a little social life, but it's very little because they got to be right back up at five o'clock in the morning. Why is that important? Important because for us as campus ministers, we're trying to figure out, man, how in the world do we get to them? But more importantly, how do we get them to us? And it can be a very challenge, especially when they're in season. So I think it's important to know, to be aware that the college athletes have a very demanding schedule with weights, uh, classes, all the things that they are doing. And so it's important to us to know that knowing maybe when they're in their off season or knowing when, they're, when there's an off day, that maybe they can't come to you, but can you come to them? Maybe as you are building a relationship with the student athlete, you find time to say, hey, when is your lunch break? Uh, hey, can we grab dinner? Is there a window of time that we can connect because nine out of 10 times, it may be hard while they're in season to come to you. Now, that doesn't give an excuse because there are times during the season, say, for example, you have a Sunday, Sunday, you know, your Sunday service. They may be able to come to that. Now, there are times in the football season, for example, that, hey, we may not get home from a trip to early two, three o'clock in the morning. They're not going to get up and go to church the next day. I'm not going to more likely get up and go to church the next day. I mean, you're, you're physically and emotionally wore out. Um, but they can't catch you online. They can't catch your service online. And so one of the unique ways as these are unique individuals is, hey, sending them your podcast or sending them your YouTube channel to the ministries, to your church ministries, finding unique ways for them to stay connected. Because again, they're unique individuals that have unique schedules and you have to think outside the box to meet them uniquely that may not be traditional. Because I can guarantee you this, they all have a phone, they all have headsets, and there's plenty of time in between from the bus ride to the airport or the downtime before a game or the Sunday morning they're in the training room that they could be tuned in, locked in, listening to a message that's coming from your church. And what you can do is follow back up with them again. Hey, what you think about the message? Hey, what are some of the things that, that jumped out? And it may just be a text conversation. And you may say, well, like, man, that takes a, a lot of time. 
Working with college athletes is a long game. It is not a short game. Uh, and I want to brag on Travis Avenue, Matt Getty, the guy that I was talking to a while ago. About 10 years ago, I invited a, a good amount of churches to come and to present to our football team about who they are, the, their service times, where they're at, and invite these athletes to their church. Um, you throw that net out. And, you know, we open up the door for these churches to come be a part, you know, come hang out, so on and so on. As time went on, more and more of those churches began to fall off. And to the point, there was only one church that was still coming around, and that was Matt Getty. And so Matt began to come more and more to FCA. He began to just to hang out. And the natural hangout was just connecting with students. And as he began to connect with students, the students began to have trust in Matt because he was in their environment. And when they were like, hey, we need a church. Well, hey, here's a church called Travis Avenue. Two young ladies that we had on our soccer team who both came in as non-believers, they both had a Catholic faith, either one of them walking with Jesus. They got plugged into FCA, gave their life to the Lord. They were discipled here through Travis Avenue, through volunteers, men and women in the church, families that wrapped their arms around these young ladies. And help them grow. I would probably say seeing their transformation from their freshman year to their senior year was life changing because you went from two individuals who did not have an understanding grasp of God's word to two individuals that were quoting Romans and walking and leading Bible studies about time that before they left. So key point is that working with college athletes is a long game. Even though that you may grab one or two, those one or two have influence in their locker room. So those young ladies who got discipled we also went back and began to have an influence in their locker room. And so 10 plus years ago, over the course of these last 10 years, the women's soccer team has had a spiritual presence because of those two young ladies who gave their life to the Lord 10 plus years ago. So I can trace back to our current soccer girls who are walking with God, who are growing with God, or who are coming to Christ, I can trace them all the way back to, to Lauren, we call them Lauren and Larry, to every girl that they impacted, touched, and how that domino effect kept going. And so my point is, is that even though it may be just a few, those few have a tremendous impact in those locker rooms. And if you can grab one or two unique athletes and help them to live out their faith in that environment, that, that uniqueness will shine bright because that's not the norm of an athlete being vocal and standing out for Christ. Because when you do have athletes who stand up for Christ, we all gravitate to it. I mean, we all, the church, everyone, we champion that. The regular student can do it. We're excited about that. But when a star athlete stands up for Christ, Man, we want to put them to the front. We want to put them on a poster. We want them at our events. We want them at our church because we know the influence that athletes have. And so it's important to understand that their schedule, the uniqueness of their life, the uniqueness of their man. So what is understanding the athlete just a little bit more? Number one, athletes are, as y'all know, this tremendously self-confident. They're motivated. They're passionate. They have a strong desire um, to succeed, they're leaders, they're goal setters, they're, natural, they're naturally self-disciplined. They're team players, they make dreams come through. They make our dreams come through, our teams when our teams win. Um, they're demanding, uh, they're, you know, those are some of the good things. And there are some of the, some, some of the challenging things that could be for athletes as well too. Their identity can be tied in their sport. And so at one minute they can be on the biggest of highs, and the next minute they can be on the biggest of lows. I've seen athletes who, one year were Rose Bowl's champion. Next year, they were suicidal because they got an injury and because they weren't playing no more and because their identity was tied up in their position or their success. And now all of a sudden, everything of who they believe that they are is no longer there. Um, they could be arrogant, just like that arrogance sometimes could be caught up with confidence, but it could be arrogant. Um, they could be, have high uh, anxiety performance. I mean, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, when you imagine that when you have major university and major sport teams, you have the eyes of the world, the eyes of the United States on this particular game, and if you miss a ball or if you strike out or if you drop a pass or if you fumble, everybody is going to let you know that you failed. 
and you're going to feel like a failure in that moment. And so think about the pressures of an athlete where in a moment you can be a folk hero where you have thousands and millions of people that don't even know who you are that are praising your name, buying your jerseys, naming your kids after you, that they exalt you up to be this individual. And when that time period is over where your four years of eligibility is gone and now all of a sudden that you don't have that same fame fair, imagine the emptiness and the hole that that leaves you. Imagine... Um, where, you know, you you won a championship, man, and just the the just the support that you give and the love that you feel, but also the anger when people feel because you lost the game. That grown men and, and mainly men, but women as well, but grown men have their identity tied into your jersey. They care for nothing for the soul of that person. And so they can lack maturity and and been all they've done is their life is play sports. So how can a church, how can a church reach this unique individual created in the image of God that have been given these gifts that we exalt in our society, probably more so than a doctor, a teacher, you know, things that really care, you know, that save lives or, you know, police officer, you know, things that really, you know, protect our lives. But there's something about sports in our DNA that connect our hearts and our hearts with God. And so how do we how do we reach? I think number one is is this is that is ex- asking and expecting nothing from them. Building a genuine, unique relationship with a unique individual. Because think about this: athletes are always something that's always asked of them. And if we're honest. And church as well, too, we want something from them. We want them part of our program because we know what they bring. But in all reality, if you want to build trust with a college athlete, ask nothing of them. Build a genuine relationship with the person and not the athlete. And what I mean by that is that if you have a star athlete and you're trying to connect with them, hey, know them. Bypass the helmet. Bypass the jersey, <clears throat> bypass the, the number, the name on the back, and get to the heart. Get to the soul. So pursue the uniqueness of them. Um, don't be a fanboy or fangirl. You know, I think that it's easy to get all struck in these young adults' ability. At the end of the day, they're kids. They're big kids. They're big, strong, fast, jumping Kids that just have a unique gift and talent. And so just like kids, they need guidance. They need accountability. They need love. They need structure. And probably even more so for a student athlete because everything that they're doing is pouring out. It is a great opportunity for the church to pour back in and to provide guidance and biblical truth and biblical structure. And so be asking yourself, hey, how do I pour back into this individual? Because the minute they get up, everything, I like to use the illustration of, you know, for what, our, what we try to do with FCA is that in the morning, you are a full glass of water. You know, we have an empty cup here. And all of a sudden, the alarm clock goes off. A little bit pours out. You get up in your car, you drive, and you go watch, start watching meetings. A little bit pours out. You get dressed and you go to practice, and a little bit more pours out. You start going throughout your day. You're sitting in classrooms and stuff like that. More poured out. You're sitting in a study hall, and you're studying. And you're up to the wee hours of night, and you pour it out. And by the end of the day, you have an empty glass and you pour it out, and guess what? You got to do it all over again. And so our role in FCA and what we try to do is to pour back in. Everything that we do through our character, through our leadership, and building their faith, we're trying to pour back in and not pour out, not pull out. When we're pulling out, it is to empower them, to deploy them, but it's not to try to get something out. And so as a church, think it through, how do we pour back into our our student athletes? Um, Man, design your programs, you know, with... Things that attract the heart of athletes, you know, is food, you know, fun and fellowship. You know, simple as that. I mean, they're, they're kids again. But, I mean, they're kids that like to eat. They're kids that like to have fun. And one of the unique things about that is it's good when they get a chance to get out their locker rooms and live in community with other sports or other individuals who do not look like a football player or a volleyball player, but they get an opportunity to hang out and meet with other people. Know their world. Be familiar with, you know, as you are mentoring, discipling a college student, man, know what their world is like. Ask them questions what their world is like. Begin to understand. Why is that important? 
because when th when they know what's important to them and they see what's important to them is also important to you, you build that level of trust and they will continue to, to let you in. Uh, love them in the highs and lows. Celebrate them when it's a victory and also be there to hold them when, they're, when it's a loss. I mean, you got to think they put their heart, their mind and soul in there. And so in a lot of ways as ministers um, that are ministering to these individuals, that our passion should be connected to what's connected to them. And so we are, we celebrate that God has given them this gift and we celebrate watching them use that gift. And when we celebrate the victories, but we also mourn with them as in often as, as a loss. And we can say it's a game and it is a game, but it's also a game that these young men and women and coaches are spending about a hundred hours of their week, their time in it. And so it's more than a game to them. I mean, it's more than a game. I mean, it's, it's, it's a life. It's their life. It's their job. It is. Yes. Losing their time. And so be there to connect uh, the long game. And I think this is where the church has to see college ministry and reaching athletes as the long game. It is little fruits on the front end, but tremendous fruits on the back end. Encouraging your, co your, your church to have an emphasis on playing the long game with reaching college athletes because there's so many layers that you have to go. There's so many stones before the seeds can plant into the heart of our students, but you have to continue to be there to remove the stones that those seeds that you are planting that at some point in time, that's going to take root and that root may not begin to sprout, but at some time it's going to sprout and you're going to be there to cultivate it and, it, and, and, and eventually it's going to start bearing fruit. And when it starts to bear fruit, it's going to bear fruit abundantly. So it is a long, and I think churches struggle with that. And I've seen churches, churches struggle with that as well. Being present. This is a key thing that we do with the FCA more than anything else. Our number one ministry, I would say emphasis is the ministry of presence. It's there's opportunity for you to be present um, on a college campus, maybe at a uh, practice, uh, maybe at games that they can see that you are there. Like for us, we're there all the time. And so we don't call no plays, but we're coaching their life. So we're at practice and we're in the coach's office, we're hanging around because some of the greatest ministry opportunities that I've seen is a student sees you standing on, a, on the practice field and comes up to you. Hey, can we talk afterwards? And it's at those moments that God begins to open up their hearts in the road to discipleship, the road to Christ is happening in that moment because they know there's someone here that I can trust, that I can have a, a conversation with. So on some, some college campuses, maybe it is you seeing if there's an end and maybe that's you coach. Hey coach, man, we like to use the current character coach. Hey coach, maybe I can serve as a character coach for your team. Maybe I can come in and my only responsibility is, is to love on your players, to encourage them, to support them, maybe help you and develop their leadership and character. As church people, I would say, hey, don't avoid the church lingo uh, because coaches don't care about all that. Unless they're believers, but what they care about, can you help build their character? Can you help build leaders? How do you, how do you add value? And some of the smaller institutions, they may be like, hey, coach, we want to bring your kids food. We want to serve you and your staff dinner. Maybe it's, you know, once a year, quarterly, but it's getting that inroads in to be able to have a present to serve and, and finding unique ways to serve those coaches and athletes. Um, and then partner with ministries that are on campus. If you have on a college campus, a FCA or AIA, maybe seeing ways that your church can support the missionary who's already there. And so that support may be resources. That support may be like, hey, it's encouraging to me when I have students like get here and say, hey, coach, where can we go to church at? I love that I can pick up the phone and call a college pastor and say, hey, I'm sending XYZ number of students to your church today. Can you please make sure someone grease them, connects with them so they just don't walk into a building and don't know anybody is because nine out of 10 times they're not gonna come back. But when there's a relationship that, hey, a church that we know and that we trust, that bridge is the bridge. And that could be even financially supporting that staff person or, hey, providing food, uh, coming to their Bible studies, their, their gatherings. And so partnering with a church 
uh, a, a parachurch ministry that maybe be already on the front lines that are serving uh, athletes. Um, and wrapping this up in just Q&A time, again, athletes are unique individuals with a unique lifestyle, but they're also an environment where the gospel is extremely needed. Um, it is, I would, in our society, the most influential environment in our society, from little league to high school to collegiate to pros. We're all crazy about our sports. Parents acting a fool over little league sports. You know, good and well, little Bobby, little Johnny, little Tyrone ain't going to the pros, but we be acting crazy like they they like they're about you know going to. We losing our mind, act like we ain't got no sense. But when we can connect our student athletes in their identity to Christ you are creating an influence of individual that can have a tremendous impact, that you are help changing the trajectory of not only that young man, but their locker room begins to become their mission field. And I've seen God over and over and over. I've done, what, probably 25 weddings of former TCU student athletes. Uh, one of the great honors when we went to California for the national championship game couple of young ladies who are from California are now living there and have their babies. Them bringing their babies back, you know, to the hotel in order that I can meet their babies and meet their husband uh, and, and celebrate with them. And so it's a unique opportunity for the church to influence our greatest influencers. It has to be a level of intentionality. It has to be a level of long game. It has to be a level of how do we go to serve? Because it's going to be a struggle for them to come to you. The advantage that we have with FCA is that we don't have walls. You know, we don't have a brick and mortar. We're not saying, hey, come, because we're going to them. We're going to be at practice. We're going to be in the locker room. We're going to be on the bus. We're going to be on the plane. And that gives us a ministry of present that is tremendously impactful. And I've seen where churches have come along where maybe there's a pastor that's a chaplain or a character coach. Maybe it's a college pastor that's a chaplain or a character coach for a particular team. It doesn't always have to be the biggest dog on the campus. It can be that one team that that maybe has a losing record that I've seen some of the greatest ministry take place. I used to work with the women's soccer team. When I first got here, one assistant ADs called and said, hey, uh, we need you to work with this team. Call me to his office. I'm thinking it's football. I'm excited. You know, it's like it was women's soccer. And they were a mess. They were a mess. Character-wise, in their life, they were a mess. But over the course of the next two years, I did a lot of leadership development with them. And I've married several of those girls, love them today, um, and watched them mature. Now our, our soccer program is one of the probably one of the best one of the best programs in the nation. But it strings back to that investment, changing that environment, investing and watching God move. So what questions y'all have for me? Um, we have sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. We have um, a track guy. And he came to the Lord about two years ago. And then, um, but was still really lost and really humble, really anxious, and was, felt that pressure, uh, but wasn't living up to it. And so he came to our house, somebody else joined the track team, they came to, came to our church and invited him. So he started coming to our church, we sat down with him, and just got to ask him some really hard questions about life mm -hmm. overall. Yep. And he really started thinking about what he was doing and why he was doing it, so then he started, like, the Lord just messed up. But mm -hmm. <laughs> he went back to his team um, and has had a lot of gospel conversations with them. If he can't have gospel conversations with them, he can't get to that place, or if it's girls or whatever, then he's just having like big life, like what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Purpose kind of talks. Um, now he's kind of he's he's to the point where he's like, I'm really struggling being around this environment and my heart hurts for them, but I feel pulled into it and I'm struggling and I really don't want to be here mm -hmm. anymore. So um, I'm sure you've had talks like that mm -hmm. with people. And we obviously want his influence there. We want other students to know the Lord, mm -hmm. and we don't have it in like he has. Um, even though we know some of the other students now, the other athletes, and we can talk to them, mm -hmm. it's all the same. And so, I don't know, just kind of like encouragement. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know, where, where is your heart at in that? I don't, I don't want to leave him in some environment, but we're all around him. Yeah, all the yeah. Time. We check on him. He's held accountable, we pray for him, we, he knows that we love him, he knows he has a place with us, we're sending him into that, that's yeah. not his home, like his, he, we're his home, but he's in, yeah. so, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's his, that's his mission field, I think God is, has allowed him to be in that environment, 
And that's where Jesus would run to. I mean, he wouldn't necessarily want to just be hanging out with the college church group, but Jesus would be running to that locker room to do life. And so what I would encourage him is like, hey, man, it's not about you. You know what I mean? It's not about, I know, I know he probably feels some kind of way, okay, hey, he's living for Christ. You know, he may not, the relationships may not be the same. He's God, kind of in that same place of becoming a believer that he's like, how do I separate? Mm-hmm. How do I How do I let the Lord change me and not be a part of it, but be in it? Like, kind yeah. of like what you're talking about, yeah. I and mean, I think he he lives in that tension. And I think it's it's an uncomfortable tension that we all, I mean, I think as adults, we would say, I mean, we, we got friends and, you know, lifestyles and sinful natures that still tug at our heart. And we have to make decisions. So I would encourage him, like, hey, man, Look at it as your mission field, asking God, how do you want to use me in this environment? How do you want to use my influence in this environment? And to have grace for his friends who are not walking with Christ, they don't have the power of God in them to to live out that Christian faith. But I think his faith will even blossom more by going into an environment and allowing God to use him and influence that environment. And I've seen kids like the guy, Mitchell Traver, he was a very strong kid when he got to TCU spiritually, but he couldn't connect well with his team. He was too high. And I remember I used to tell him, like, bro, you need to bring it down. Like, you're like, you're just, you can't connect because you're too, yes, like, bring it down. Like, like I mean, I understand the zealness of your heart, but you're not going to win the guys over by just, just like, you know, dust says the Lord. Like, man, get in here, build relationships, get, learn Un- begin to understand who they are, you know, begin to understand your teammates, the person, and not just like it's you against them. Like, no, like you, you know, Christ, you once were a sinner separated from Christ. So have that same grace and compassion that God has offered you. Go love your teammates. And if they don't come to Christ, you know what? Be a light, be an influence. So you fast forward years later, you see them coming full circle in the sense that they know who to go talk to when life his rock bottom. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you touched on that too because that's been that's been a problem before too that we've had people who really love the Lord who really want to like their hearts are yeah. broken for their teammates but they like can't they're just like yeah. I have to talk about the Lord only all the time I know hardcore, you know, like, yeah, that's so fantastic but <laughs> think about where you were at yeah that would not have come it wouldn't have translated so. no no okay. not at all well, thank you um, how do you, I think I know the answer to the question, but I know that you, obviously you're at TCU, so it's a different, I think a different environment than I probably would have at UTRGV. Um, I have the, we have the approval, FCA does, of, uh, of the AD, which is Chase Conn, and, uh, he loves FCA, wants FCA on the campus, mm-hmm. but I'm not a college athlete. Yeah. And... I was asked to come lead a Bible study uh, with a basketball team. And uh, I know a couple of guys had to visit our church. Uh, yeah. They were on the team. And, but even then, man, I felt like I was just out of place, man. Mm-hmm. Like the uniqueness of it mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, that's a basketball team. I led a Bible study. I, I, don't think, I don't think it went great in a sense because I was like, you know, it was like I, I was getting any feedback. And yeah. Talk and, yeah. But, I mean, with the other athletes, you know, on a regular basis with the with the with the actual FCA that's on campus, and it's just different. I can talk with mm-hmm. them, I do life with them, I have breakfast with them, mm-hmm. I pour into them as much as I can. Um, how do I make the how do how do I make that connection with those other athletes at FCA? How do I go into a locker room? Mm-hmm. Well, I just yeah, I just that's, that, that's a great question. Great, great question. So, number one, I love that question. So. So even though they're unique and you say, hey, I'm not a college athlete, but there are a lot of other things that you have in common. Like you are a man, you are a male. And so what you can do is ask yourself the question, how would I have reached myself at 18 or 19 years old? You know, if you looked into the mirror and asked yourself the question, how would I have reached me? What would have reached me at 18, 19, 20 years old? What was pulling at my heart? What was distracting my heart. And so begin to think about you and putting going back in your mind and heart into thinking about where you were at and being starting there. Then I think too, you just got to be yourself. And I think one of the pressures where you feel, and I've seen senior pastors leave great church, get into the locker room and just straight goofball it up. Like they forget like how to, de- to 
you know, to expository God's word. At the end of the day, you want to keep it simple and you want to keep it relevant in the sense of when you're going to minister, say, for example, chapel. So when I do a chapel, I um, a couple things I'm going to come in with. I am going to I am going to know where they're at in the season. You know, I don't I really I try not I, I kind of pre script some of my messages you know, like, like, hey, I think I'm going to talk about this, but, man, you can have a total pivot or a total churn, and all of a sudden, if you're talking about one thing, you're like, man, you just totally missed the mark. But you want to be in tune to where they're at in, in the season. Um, I want to come in. I want to keep it about 15, 20 minutes. You know what I mean? Whatever the time frame, if it's 10 minutes, I'm going to finish up at 8 minutes. I want to make sure that I'm in and I'm precise. I want to dial in on my message. You know, I want to give the biblical truth an application of the message and not necessarily try to, to make the message fit the sports world, but how does it fit their life? And then maybe find a story that's connecting athletically and, and leave them with maybe just a little piece of like, Hey guys, girls, you glorify God through your play. And so I don't try to go in and try to do a hoorah. I go in to give them the word of God and how can they live that word of God out, their principle out in their life and in their sports? And so I would say be who you are and not disqualifying yourself that, hey, I'm not a student athlete. Because in the world of sports, like at TCU, the football locker room is like my home. I'm a former football player. I understand that. The baseball locker room is a totally different group, group of guys. I mean, totally. So I can do the same message and get a totally different response out of Two different locker rooms. And so what I've had to learn is like, hey, I wasn't a college baseball player. I mean, no one in the world, I'll try to stand there and hit a ball that's coming 9,500 miles per hour and try to swing at that thing. But where I can connect with them is that, is, hey, is I'm a man. And one day, I was in the past, I was a young man. And I connect there and think about where they're at. And, and oftentimes, what athletes need is encouragement, confidence, to be reassured. Uh, because in their mind, so much of their world is pass or fail. And so you want to help them to, hey, don't be anxious for nothing. Hey, uh, in Psalms, I look to the hills which come as my help. My help's coming from the Lord. Um, you know, Psalms 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, breaking that passage down that they can see. Psalms 1, um, blessed is the man who walks not in uncounseled and ungodly. You know, what does the blessed life look like? You know, what does it look like to be rooted? What does it look like to be planted by rivers of waters? What does it look like to bear godly fruits in their lives. And so taking the word of God and making it like we do in any setting, but just removing ourselves and not disqualifying ourselves, because at the end of the day, just be you. And that's the thing that they're going to love is just you. And so you don't have to have, we don't have to have any resume builder, um, but you just got to just go be you. How do you, uh, and I, and I, Careful when I say competition, but um, so on our campus, we are trying to include all the athletes. In the mm -hmm. But you don't ever, because of their time and what you need and what they do, you never, you know, we're, SC is careful about when they meet with them. Mm -hmm. So there's a guy that he's a former, former baseball player, still connected with the team. And he's a he's a member of a local one of the local churches there. Well, he, he asked he convinced the coach or asked him if he could be like the character coach, I guess whatever. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, what we're finding is that baseball team, you know, it's hard to hard to connect with them, mm -hmm. hard to connect with them because they feel well. I'm already getting on Monday night. Why don't I need to go to you? Or how do you connect with them? Get to like how do you build? A, Bridge that gap, mm -hmm. you know, because I, we you know we and we connect with a few of them, you know, handful mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that do come to FCA and mm -hmm. um, a couple of pastors' kids that, that are yeah. still serving or still yeah. know that they had a call in their life, and then someone just got recently saved. That's how kind of mm -hmm. how we started the chapter and stuff. But I don't want to compete, and the guy's an awesome guy. I love, but great Bible teacher, man. Uh -huh. Awesome, and I would hate to, to you know that the, those the way he's teaching, bro. They need it, right? Yeah. So, but we try to like, hey, let's partner up, or hey, let and he won't, he yeah. won't partner. Like, he's yeah, like, I'm doing my thing Monday night. Don't ask me like, hey, come come talk to our FC group, right? Yeah, nah, I gotta do that. I do Monday nights only. Yeah, I'm like, come on, man, like kingdom build, man, like, and it's just how have you had that situation? If you do, why yeah. Do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, and that that can be tough. I mean, I, I I think the way that I try to look at it is this: is that 
with us, how we look at each sports team is is, is community. Right. And if there's somebody that's serving that community, <laughs> then if if there's ways to partner, they partner. If it's not, then it, it just it is it is what it is. I think we celebrate that they're getting poured into, uh, and I think we celebrate that somebody's there to to support them. Um, and then I think you know just continue just to be faithful in what God, the doors that God is is giving you, the athletes that God has given you. Um, be faithful there because what happens is if you're investing in the ones that he is giving you, they're going to go back and tell, you know what I mean? And they will be your biggest recruiters and to bring students to, you know, your, your events, so on and so on. So be faithful to the ones that he is giving you, mold them up, build them up, disciple them. They're going to, they're going to go be your greatest recruiters. They're going to be your greatest advocate. And then I'll say the power of social media should keep sharing the story because when students see like, Oh, that's what's going on over there. Oh, that's what's happening over there. Oh, when they see that, like, I need to go be a part of that. Because in their mind, it's just like, oh, it's just another Bible study. I'm already getting that on Monday nights. Like, what's the difference? You know what I mean? And maybe the difference is the fellowship. Maybe the difference is the, the worship. Maybe the difference is the overall experience. And they see, like, oh, maybe I should go investigate and check that out. Yeah, pour in, pour out method. Is that something you learned along the way? I heard that with Wayne Cordero mm-hmm. out of Hawaii. And similar thing, like, you know, make, and he was talking specifically to pastors, like, make sure that you get poured into. Yeah. So I love that. And I think mm-hmm. I, I try to do that as best I can. Um, but uh, how, how, how do we do it better, especially for athletes? Like, how do we, or how do we gauge whether, like, how do you, is it the relationship that spend mm-hmm. time with them more, mm-hmm. or do I need to create more time for them? Mm-hmm. Um my biggest problem is, is there's only one of me. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I need to build a team. That's one of the things I want to do is yeah. hopefully build, and I'm trying to build out of our church mm-hmm. to do that. I love what you said about what Travis Avenue did, that they stayed up. I, I, I foresee that. Like, I'm, I'm in for the long game. Yeah. Our pastor's in for the long game. Mm-hmm. Um, so is there any suggestions, like, not to get discouraged, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we, we know this as, as ministers – that I think we always have to live and not forget that we need Jesus. You know what I mean? Like we're quick to jump out of bed to go pour into others, but we're slow to pour into ourselves. Like there is a, I would say, a consistent war, a desire to do what's good, but I think we can be, we have to shift our paradigm and our love and affection for God and for his word. And that we are only to give out of the overflow of what is that's in us. And I've been there. I mean, I've, you know, early in ministry, man, 100 miles per hour, you know, here, there, by myself, running up and down TCU's campus, working with as many teams that I could possibly, then family and kids. And all of a sudden, you're looking at like home is suffering. Because, man, I'm up here investing in all these kids and coaches and stuff like that. But my wife and my marriage is suffering. You know, my young kids, she, you know, she's trying to, you know, figure this thing out. And I'm neglecting, you know, my number one responsibility. So I think it's just, it's keeping the main thing, the main thing, your relationship with Christ. God doesn't need us, but he invites us to be a part of that. Uh, whole ministry lightly in the sense that if you're not there, his spirit is still working. Like, even if you're not on that campus, like, I haven't been on campus in a couple of weeks and I'm happy to not be there because this is like, I need a break. I need to be refreshed. I need my mind to be refreshed. Now, June 1 come, I'm back there. I'm going to like, let's go. Let's get it. But right now, I don't want to see nobody. I don't want to see no coach. I don't want to see no player. I don't want to see nobody. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to see nobody because, man, I need to restore my soul. Um, but I would say, man, just continue to be poured into, continue to have other people that that run similar lane to understand what you do as ministers and that can help encourage us, you know, making sure that our tank, our hood is good, that we're good, that our mind is good, our body is good, our heart is good. Um, like, man, I've neglected my body. I'm, I'm down about 35 pounds, so I've neglected my body over the years. It's just not taking care of myself, uh, putting, you know, how I eat. You know, I just go out to lunch. You know, you, you're eating all that during time. And, you know, shoot, you know, I think I was 200 pounds that I got married. I think I got up to like 335 is, is the highest I've been. And I'm just like, man, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like you're killing yourself to try to save others. And it's like, I work with athletes. Like I can't talk to these jokers about being disciplined. I'm not even being disciplined, you know, myself. But I've shifted my paradigm. It's just like, okay, I got to start fighting 
take care of myself. And, and I think, man, just take care of self, loving God, and, man, just taking it day by day and allowing, asking the Lord to give me vision and to send the help to help you reach. The ministry is going to let you know when it's time to hire and bring others on. Like, I didn't hire nobody to what, maybe four years after being at TCU because we only had a handful of kids involved in it. It wasn't no need to have staff. You know, financially, we didn't have we didn't have the resources then. You know, you fast forward 13 years later, I mean, we got plenty of financial resources. We got a team of four individuals, administrative assistant, an intern, and because the ministry has grown, uh, our presence has grown. And so, but if, year one, I couldn't handle that no way. Couldn't handle the staff, nor could I handle the amount, of, the amount of kids. And so the ministry, stay faithful to your personal walk with God, taking it daily, asking God to give you vision for the, the future, begin to walk in that vision, and he's going to send people. Be clear in letting people articulate your vision, what you see God can do, and allow God to bring people alongside you to help that vision come to fruition. It has been really first, um, kind of, I would say convicting, but I don't think that it's from the Lord. So I think it's a distraction. It makes me so guilty. It makes Caleb, maybe, I don't know if he feels it or not, my husband. But to just reach all the teams, because I don't want to leave any teams out. I'm like, okay, I want to reach all of them. So how do we, how do we, like, do a meal for all of them? But if we do a meal for them, like, we do a meal for them and it's good, and maybe we get to talk to them, but the real thing is reaching one. Somehow we reach one in some crazy situation where we're just around or we're near somebody that's in class with them or somehow there's weird things and then we reach one and then they're talking to their their team and then we're coming doing meals with them. We're coming to their games. They know who we are. We say hi to them. We can talk to them. We can talk to them after and whatever. So um, it's really exciting where we're at with with having a few teams now that we're like, okay, this is how it's going to happen. It's mm-hmm. not going to just be like, we have to get everybody on the schedule and force, force, force. Um, because the same thing, we've built like a leadership, student leadership team in the last few years of being there. And so that's mm-hmm. getting up and running and the yep. people that they're in organizations with. And um, now we have some older older adults in the church who are wanting to reach teams on their own because yeah. they're boosters or they're yeah. around or they care about the sport or they play that sport. Mm-hmm. And um, do y'all have any people that, do y'all have any or have you heard of any people who are like character coaches that mm-hmm. can get into a team and be around who are not pastors? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I would I'm, and I would even say, shoot, I would even try to use it like a pastor because I mean, their time, I'm looking for somebody who has the availability to go and to, you know, spin you know, can be at a football practice and not feel pressure. They that like that becomes their ministry. Like a pastor, he's doing all this. Yeah. yeah. And so finding and any church like this, I mean you got hundreds of people that can fall in that line. And so getting a volunteer, like that becomes their ministry. And I think you look for a person who connect well with students that gets the gets that environment, that are not a fanboy or fangirl, that you know, you train them up and say, hey, like you're not trying to get anything from them. You're going to pour back into them and you know the role of a character coach would be being present being visible finding ways to serve you know local schools and some of the stuff that we do at the high schools here you know one of my goals is that every high school in in fort worth isd has chapel and chick-fil-a and so every friday they'll do a chapel and they'll have chick-fil-a at that chapel and so we're speeding we're feeding the, the spirit and we're feeding the you know the body and 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 what we won't do it but we'll partner with local churches that will go and we will make bridge the gap, but they will go have somebody from that church to go feed them. We'll we'll do some of the legwork with bridging Chick Fil A to that local church and to the local church to those student athletes. We did a uh, last year Chase gave us permission to do a uh, welcome back. Mm-hmm. Um, so we invite all the teams to come on September second, mm-hmm. uh, for Labor Day, and um, our church. I was I got Chick Fil A sponsored soda sandwiches. I got uh, Rudy's to sponsor 100 sandwiches. Y'all was eating good. Uh, we had one of our, the local football team, uh, one of the dads, he's, a, he's on the booster club, was his son's playing baseball with some of the athletes that are on the baseball team. So I asked George, I said, hey man, so would you come do a taquisa? And so he's on the flat top, he's cooking meat, making tacos. and um, But that gained so much traction. So we got to meet the coaches face to face. Uh, we just hang out with them where they know us in town. They know us at the games, being present. Um, and so it's, it's been, that's been a good connection um, with them. And um, 
What time of year is y'all do that? Do it? What time of year? September second. Okay. Right. At, well, so all the athletes are back at back in. Do it outside? We actually did it in the bed behind in the back of the rec center where they have their and so we had this huge space. There's a storm that came in and we're like, this ain't gonna happen, man. Like it's you know, we had a dunk booth with all the coaches. So we convinced the coaches to get in the dunk booth and their athletes came and dunked them. That was pretty cool. And uh, we had the BSN partnered up with us. Um and they uh, brought they have a smoothie truck. Hmm. And they brought their smoothie truck out and making smoothies for all the kids. I love that. You know, so um they ate, and they mm-hmm. fellowship, mm-hmm. you know, and then uh, and this year we're gonna step it up, and we're gonna have a sign up for them if they want to be adopted by one of our members of our church. I love that. So what I we're working that. on this summer is recruiting. Yeah, yeah. our church, hey, you know what? We're gonna go do this on September second. Yep. We'd love for you guys to have a name at the end of it. We have 30, 40 people that said, hey, I wanna, I wanna adopt an athlete. For them. Yep. And we're gonna have some guidelines to go with it. Is show them to their games. Mm-hmm. Being present and cheering yep. them, making posters for them, yep. loving on them and stuff. So. And undoubtedly, if they're at that and they know that student, then another student's going to come and be like, "Hey, I need somebody too." Like, "Hey, yeah. yes, person, yes, like, yes." Like, but it, it took a you know this year we're trying to get other churches involved as well. Uh, last year it was only us and the Methodist um, organization on campus. They plugged in with us. I love that. So I'm hoping that we can we can do it. But one more question, and so you did football, right? So we're, we're about to start a football program down in, down in Edinburgh. Um, Indian. What, is, what are some of the things I need to prepare? Because I know football is a different animal uh-huh. compared to basketball, mm-hmm. volleyball, and everything else. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things that I should maybe focus on? Or, what, or like, what are some things that we, I say we as the FCA group, what are some of the things we should be looking for to maybe kind of understand what's about to hit the real grand battle when it comes to the football team? Um, so to be able to minister, because that's a wide net. Mm-hmm. You're talking about probably 80, 90 players. Yeah. Probably yeah. the biggest thing we've got, I mean, right now we have 15 players per team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, roughly. And that's yeah. the hardest ministry. It, well, it is hard. But yeah. Hard yeah. I think the one of the good things about football teams is, is that like chapel is a kind of a part of a football culture. Okay. And so having chaplains and character coaches. And so there's a natural buy in in football to want to develop. The not only the physical side, but also the spiritual leadership leadership side. And so I would say be prepared to how can we be available to serve and how can we you free up time to just be there? You know, what I mean, to be at the locker room, to be at practice, uh, to, you know, to be at a game, because by being there, God is going to begin to show you what needs to be done. I mean, because it for us, but like right now, their hiring coaches start to create investments with them. Man, I would be praying. Man, I would you know introduce yourself once they get a head coach. Uh, man, I would just a coach. Man, we love to just man just to come help you build a successful program. And so, man, I would just say just trying to get that that in doorway in. To there and and, and so man, because I, I mean it's it's just a big youth ministry. You're not gonna reach everybody, and you'll be surprised the kids that uh, I learned this a couple years ago. Coleman and I, it was it was about three or four years ago. We lost the last game of the year. We didn't go to bowl game, and we were standing right kind of where the guys would step out and you know lead the locker room. And man, we had so many kids that didn't come to our weekly stuff, just telling us thank you for how we invest in their lives. And we were, we were both were kind of like, oh wow. You know, I mean, we and it could have been they could have been at some of the team stuff, been encouraged. It could have been just a high five. It could have been just, hey, how are you doing today? Just checking in on them. It could have just been a, a conversation. And so there was what they showed me. Sometimes just even the little deposits can have such a big impact in someone's life. And so, man, I would say high five as many kids as you can, shake as many kids hands as you can, hug as many kids as you can, and God will begin to show you what's your ministry, shape your ministry, what it's going to look like there. How's Gunnar Henderson on your team, man? He's fast, man. He's fast. Gunnar's a good kid, man. Really, really good kid. Now, I, yeah. I, I know his parents. Yeah, good good like, kid, man. With the Saints now, he'll, say he'll get a chance to live our dream. He, he, yeah, yep. Well, man, well, thank you all so much. Um, and uh, anything that I can help you out with, uh, man, please don't hesitate to reach out.